Mr. Stephen Sue, Chairman Mr. Wu, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the H. Franny Housing Seminar organized by the Hong Kong Housing Society. I'm Sabrina Lee, the MC for today. Like many other developed cities in the world, Hong Kong is facing the challenge of an aging population, and housing is one of the key issues to be addressed. The Hong Kong Housing Society is a pioneer in developing elderly housing in Hong Kong. It also established the Elderly Resources Center at Prosperous Garden in Yao Ma Te 10 years ago to promote the concept of aging in place in the community. This seminar today is one of the major events to mark the 10th anniversary of the center. Before we start, may I remind you all to set your mobile phones to silent mode and refrain from taking photos during the seminar to avoid disturbances to the speakers and other participants. To start off, I would like to call upon the chairman of the Housing Society, Mr. Mark Wu, to say a few words. Mr. Wu, please. Mr. Stephen Seal, <coughs> distinguished speakers and guests, Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> on behalf of the Hong Kong Housing Society, I welcome you all to this seminar to mark the 10th anniversary of the Housing Society Elderly Resources Center. The Housing Society is a visionary organization in a way that always pays heed to the changing housing needs in the community and explores initiative, innovative uh, solutions. Back in the 1990s, we envisaged the aging trend of the population of Hong Kong and started to look at the housing needs of the elderly through a series of studies. The studies reveal that most elderly people, regardless of their financial means, prefer to age in their own homes or local communities. Should that be the case, an age-friendly living environment with support services will be needed to help them realize their aspirations. The findings have prompted the Housing Society to start developing the first elderly housing projects in town, the two pilot projects, namely Jolly Place and Cheerful Court, were completed in the year 2003 and 2004, respectively under the Senior Citizen Residences Scheme. With, plan, with the land premium concession offered by government, the two projects target at the middle-income elderly with food supporting services under the same roof to enable the tenants to live independently and aged in place. Currently, we are working on a new concept of quality retirement housing called Joyous Living, with a pilot project at the Tender Hill in North Point. This project has just been completed and will soon be launched for lease for the elderly at market prices. For the lower income elderly, we have since the year 2012 introduced an aging in place program in our public rental housing estates aiming to provide elderly support facilities and services to their senior residents to cater for their housing, social, and health needs. And we don't just look after our own residents. We have also rolled out various initiatives for the senior citizens in the community. One notable example is the Elderly Resources Center established in 2005 to promote the concept of aging in place. Over the past decade, the ERC has helped enhance the awareness of home safety among the elderly in both private and public housing, which is the basis of age friendliness. I'm most delighted that on the 10th anniversary of the ERC, we have this very special occasion to bring together experts from Hong Kong and overseas 
to share their views and experience on this important on the importance of age-friendly housing, which I believe will spark off inspirations for us to generate further initiatives and solutions for the aging population. Taking this opportunity, I would also like to extend my gratitude to all the people who support this seminar, especially our guest of honor today, Mr. Seal, and also all the speakers, panel moderators, and support organizations. This seminar will not be as successful without your participation. And last but not least, I thank everyone here for taking the time to join us in the seminar today and hope that you all will have a very rewarding time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Please take a seat. We apologize that Mr. Matthew Zheng, Secretary for Labor and Welfare of the Hong Kong SAR government, cannot attend to this seminar today because he is still engaging in the electrical meeting. And now we are most honored to have Mr. Stephen Su, Under Secretary for Labor and Welfare of the Hong Kong SAR government, to open the seminar for us. Mr. Su, please. Mr. Marco Wu, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Mr. Matthew Cheung, may I just convey again his deep apologies. And uh, as the uh, MC has told you, he is still being engaged in the Legislative Council, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether they're still calling column at the moment. <laughs> so. But anyway, indeed, I'm honored to have the opportunity of speaking at the seminar and meeting experts from the fields of healthcare, technology, social service, gerontology, <laughs> occupational therapy, architecture, planning, and design. So let me begin by thanking the Hong Kong Housing Society for organizing this most timely seminar designed to address the housing needs of our senior citizens in light of Hong Kong's rapidly aging population. I would also like to warmly congratulate the Elderly Resource Center, ERC, of the Housing Society on its 10th anniversary this year. Established in 2005 by the Housing Society, the ERC is the first one-stop platform in Hong Kong which focuses on building age-friendly homes that are safe, comfortable, and well-equipped to meet the needs of the elderly. Through public education programs, health screening and home assessment services, professional consultation and expert research, the ERC stands at the forefront to promote the concept of aging in place. In the past 10 years, ERC has served 274,000 people, including 78,000 center visitors, and 196,000 participants of various activities such as exhibitions, education, talks, and training. Moreover, the Housing Society has, through the ERC, contributed a substantial $100 million to promote the concept of aging in place to our senior citizens. In the current financial year, the Housing Society will spend $24 million in an aging in place scheme for 14 rental estates. This amount is expected to go up to $38 million next year as the scheme extends to 20 rental estates. This speaks volumes about the Housing Society's certain contribution to building an elderly friendly community. Like many other developed economies, Hong Kong is rapidly growing. Improvements in health and shrinking fertility rates also add to our aging population. The life expectancy at birth in Hong Kong is currently 81.2 years for males and 86.9 years for females, almost the highest in the world. According to the latest population projections released about um, 
five weeks ago. These figures were right to 87 years for males and 92.5 years for females by 2064. There were 1,065,300 people aged 65 or above in Hong Kong as at 2014, meaning one out of seven Hong Kong residents was a senior citizen. These figures will rise to a staggering 2,525,000 in 2044 and 2,582,000 in 2064, translating into the ratio of one in three. The aging trend is also demonstrated by the increasing medium age of our population, which will rise from 43.7 in 2014 to 53.5 in 2064. Obviously, this major demographic shift poses a huge challenge for Hong Kong. This is why the current term government has ranked elderly care high on our policy agenda. We need to make strategic decisions and prepare for a fast aging population and more importantly, to build age-friendly communities so that our senior citizens can enjoy their golden years in a safe, positive, meaningful, graceful, and dignified manner. To encourage more concerted efforts in building age-friendly environments across the world. The World Health Organization, WHO, has developed the WHO Global Network of Age-Friendly Centers and Communities. I'm pleased to say that three of Hong Kong's 18 districts, Saigon, Kwai Cheng, and Chun Wan, have become accredited members of the network. This marks an important step in making Hong Kong an elderly-friendly city. These three districts had pledged to make the local environment more friendly to our senior citizens in terms of eight indicators, namely outdoor space and buildings, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, and community support and health services. The Hong Kong SAR government is committed to improving the livelihood of our senior citizens, and putting in place an elderly friendly culture. The estimated recurring expenditure on elderly care services in 2015 to 16 amounts to about $6.8 billion, representing 11.5% of the total recurring social welfare expenditure. So taking into consideration government spending on social security and health care, the current expenditure for the elderly as a whole will add up to a substantial $62 billion, or a significant 19.1% of the total government recurrent expenditure in 2015 to 16. The government has been improving both the hardware and software at the community level for use by our senior citizens. Since 2014 to 15, we have increased the annual recurrent funding by some $160 million to upgrade our social centers for the elderly to neighborhood elderly centers and enable all subvented elderly centers to increase their manpower and program expenses, strengthen volunteer mobilization, counseling service, and care support to enhance the attractiveness of our elderly centers, especially to those with better education and wider interest the Social Welfare Department introduced the improvement program of Elderly Centre in 2012 with an allocation of $900 million, $900 million from the Notary Fund. So far, a total of 200, 237 elderly centres have joined the program to upgrade the physical setup, such as acquiring computer equipment for lifelong learning and fitness exercise equipment for health. To encourage our senior citizens to participate more in community activities, the Labor and Welfare Bureau has been implementing the Public Transport Fair Concession Scheme for the elderly and eligible persons with disabilities since June 2012. Under the scheme, senior citizens can travel on the general mass transit railway lines, franchise buses, ferries, and 94% of all green minibuses at a concessionary rate 
of $2 per trip anytime. This scheme has proved highly popular and effective in encouraging the elderly to participate more in the community and widen their social networks. The number of average daily passenger trips made under the highly popular scheme is around 950,000, which include 800,000 trips made by elderly people. This scheme is estimated to cost the government $900 million in this financial year in terms of reimbursement to the public transport operators for the differential in fair revenue foregone. I see this as many well spent and the scheme fully realized the concept of active aging. The government is mindful of the need to ensure barrier-free access not only for people with disabilities but also for our growing elderly population. We're therefore stepping up our efforts in removing or reducing all the hurdles hampering the physical movement in society. To make Hong Kong more age-friendly, the government will continue to join hands with the housing society and other community partners in striving to improve our hardware and software as well as foster a culture most caring for the elderly. To this end, we need concerted action rather than mounting common platitudes. On this note, I wish this seminar every success and all of you a fruitful and stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sue. Please take a seat. Now, the seminar is now kick-started. First of all, let me briefly explain today's arrangement. We have four speakers, local and overseas, sharing their experience on elderly housing in this plenary session. After this, we will have tea break around 4, uh, 3.40. Following the tea break will be two discussion panels held concurrently. Panel A will be conducted in this room with the theme Challenges for Purpose Built Housing for the Elderly in Hong Kong, while Panel B, Building an Age-Friendly Community, will be held in room 423, just opposite this room. After the panel discussions, we will all come back here again for sharing the discussions in the panels. Now, let me introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Joost van Hoof, he is the head of the Fontys EGT of the Center of, for Healthcare and Technology of Fontys University of Applied Sciences in Netherlands. He is going to talk about the design of home environments to enhance the quality of living among older people. Dr. van Hoof, please. I really feel like I stand out in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> thanks for helping me. Um, well, Mr. Wu, thank you so much for having me here um, in, in Hong Kong. I am afraid that some of the slides will actually pop to the next slide if I don't um, watch out. Um, don't think the roofs are leaking over here. It's actually some images of a social innovation project we did in one of the assisted, facility, um, um, assisted living facilities that we work with. And people didn't know each other. They were just complete strangers living in the same corridor. And we had them as tour guides, walking around with umbrellas and telling about their um, family histories and the furnitures. And people are now actually having tea together. They've become friends. And that's one of the projects that actually do in my daily business. Um, some backgrounds in the Netherlands, because that's where I'm from. Um, in the Netherlands, we also have population of aging of population, just like in Hong Kong. About one out of five people are currently retired. We have 2.9 million people who are um, 65 years and older. And of course, this number is slowly growing towards three quarters of them. No. We actually have already three quarters of a, peop of a million um, people aged 80 and over. So we have double aging in the Netherlands as well. Um, aging in place, so living longer independently in the community, is regarded as the ideal by our government. And that means that people have to live longer in their own home with little care support. We see that modified dwellings are considered to be part of the solution, um, technology as well, and of course there's additional care support when needed for the people who have a very bad um, health status. Um, one of the 
um, quotes that we hear from government workers is that it is important that older people start thinking about how they wish to live in time. So people who are aged 50 or 40 already need to start considering how they wish to age um, when they reach the age of 70 or 80 years old. Um, residential care homes, assisted living facilities are being phased out by the government and we see that new nursing home admissions are not very easy. Um, we have higher thresholds set up for admissions and that's something we see all throughout Europe, I think. And apart from the national state, we have the municipalities who kick in and they have to do their share of the, um, of the challenge. And that means that the municipalities, and we have over 300 in the Netherlands, have a role to play. They provide all the people with advice and information, a bit like the elderly resources center. And municipalities help to find adequate care services for all the people and support, which includes daycare, the provision of domestic support, like cleaning, um, caregiver support, so like someone to talk to, to share experiences, and sometimes municipalities even fund assistive technologies and home modifications like mobility scooters, um, specialized kitchens, and modified bathrooms. Well, this is, these are two, um, or no, three quotes that I took from a befriended um, care organization called Vitalis. And in the Netherlands, we have so-called ambitions, the three homes ambitions, and it translates pretty well into English. That means that we all like to strive to achieve high-end rehabilitation for all the people, for instance, after a hip fracture, which um, translates like people need to return home sooner, so the length of stay in rehabilitation centers should go down. We also like to think that we should supply high quality intensive um, nursing home care, which should be like home. So people who are admitted to a nursing home should have a sense of home and actually feel like the last six months of their life are just as fine as the years of life they spend in their own home in the community. And then of course we have community care supplied by professional nurses um, to support people in aging in place and people should actually continue to live at home longer. Um, but we also have challenges. No country is free of challenges, I'm afraid. Um, we have a great lack of suitable housing in the Netherlands. And actually, there's a prediction that till the uh, year 2021, we need to build 44,000 senior-proof dwellings each and every single year. And I'm afraid we will not meet this challenge whatsoever because of a multitude of reasons. Um, the current building regulations are not really suitable or adequate enough. We do focus too much on mobility, impaired mobility, like no threshold, single level floors, and so on. The people with visual disabilities or dementia are not catered for yet. And that's, that's quite problematic because we do see a large increase in the number of people with, the, the, yeah, the number of people with dementia, about 400,000 in total. They are not being taken care of. We have a limited home ownership. If you look at the older population in the Netherlands, less than 50% own a home. And that means that we have a tenant, and the tenant has to give permission if you want to modify a dwelling. And many people say no, because you're old and you may die next year, and then we have to pay for retrofitting the home once again. So that's, that's a great limitation. Then on the other hand, we have few standards. We have few scientific systematic research being done to verify if and how independence and well-being are being supported by modifications. And if there is no evidence, then there is no willingness on behalf of the municipalities and the insurances to pay for these home solutions, home modifications and technologies. Current design guidelines are frequently based on practical experience only. On the one hand, that's a good thing. That it means that the practical community thinks about solutions, but we need more substantial evidence. Again, it's a matter of financing. And um, if you look at occupational therapists, social workers, nurses, they don't have received, or haven't received enough um, adequate training or education how to deal um, with home modifications. So. In the end, how do we, um, yeah, do we age in place or support aging in place in times that the state is withdrawing? Because that's what's going on in the Netherlands right now. Well, it's nice to draw some parallel, 
parallels between Hong Kong and the Netherlands and um, the need for educational programs and training. So you have Hong Kong and you have Rotterdam um, in terms of skyline. We have the Elderly Resources Center and um, um, with its um, facilities. And we got a similar program that I want to show you some slides um, of um, called Technology at Home. And um, we do a lot of um, transfer of knowledge to the practical community. And that's, that's thing, I think, a good thing to do. So the Technology um, at Home program, um, it encompasses um, the construction of a couple of demonstration dwellings in the central town of Woerde in the Netherlands, where we take occupational therapists, um, um, case managers, real estate developers and architects, policy makers as well, and they can see how you can design for older people with various health problems. So we have a special um, home for people with dementia, for people with mobility um, issues, people with blindness or poor eyesight. And you can actually see the differences in um, layouts, architectural layouts and technologies. And it really helps um, architects to think about the designs and how to retrofit. And on the other hand, you can also go there to do some cherry picking and look at the solutions that are put in place and just select whatever you like, take it back home and implement it. Um, one of these houses is something that I was involved in quite strongly, which was a dementia dwelling or a dementia demonstration dwelling, um, which was opened about um, three years ago. Um, and it, it, it was actually based on doing um, group, focus group sessions with architects, but also with people with dementia themselves. And it was all based on the available literature um, on evidence-based design. And what I like so much about this dwelling is that it is actually visited by many people on a daily basis. And you really see that the it's like a three-dimensional book. People can go there, see and experience all these solutions. And all of these solutions are being brought back home or taken back home and implemented in the field. And it's about sidelines. It's main, mainly about low-tech interventions. And that's something many people in the Netherlands don't really like. They want to see robots. They want to see smart home technologies. But it's mainly about the small, cheap, low-budget, no-budget solutions that need to be identified. Because the more cost-effective it is, the more willing people are to spend money and do it. Um, some images of the of the dwelling. So it's actually, you see a, a toilet bowl without a lid. Very simple, but you, if people forget to, to, to put up the lid, you can't sit on top of it and someone else needs to clean. Very smart things. It's about the oven. Many people in the Netherlands use the oven as an additional cupboard. They put it full of plastic and food and so on. So when someone with dementia starts to preheat the oven, which even has been unplugged, then you get the smoldering of the plastic and the stench, and people get a panic attack. So we want people to clear out the ovens. And there's many of these small, simple solutions that you can actually see in this, in this dwelling, just like this little fireplace, which is not, it's an artificial fireplace that people could buy at a do-it-yourself store. Like, get rid of those, because people might actually think it's a fireplace and set the whole thing on fire. Um, what we also did, for the people who can't visit our center, um, we made a website together with the Dutch Alzheimer's Society, um, which we put together with the um, ambassadors of a Dutch Alzheimer's Society. They have a couple of older people who actually like to think along with people like me on how to do design websites and houses. And we put this website together. It's their type of Dutch language, which fits the... Um, it's, it's a bit like having respect for all the people on a, on a type of language that they can understand. Not very formal, but not very too informal at the same time. And it was great fun doing all this design with these older people together, and we actually published about it. But it's, it's a good way of getting your knowledge into the field. Um, so how about technology, if we only have a look at, um, at home modifications. Well, technology does matter, and it can contribute to aging in place. And I did a um, large cohort study in the Netherlands on, um, on sensor-based networks in, inside dwellings. And it was quite funny to see that many managers if, who work for um, healthcare organizations like to focus on the need for new smart home technologies. And they all claim that it can delay institutional care and that it can improve the sense of safety and security among older people. 
But the question always was, do these systems actually work? And do people really like these systems? And do they accept them? And do they use them? And can they actually age in place longer? Well, that's what we studied. And we did see that there was an increase in the quality of care through the use of technology because people couldn't press the alarm buttons around the necks, like the emergency response buttons, to complain about the quality of food. So you only had real fall incidents and real emergency situations that were being detected. But at the same time, we also saw, based on what these other people told me, that technology alone offered no solution. A lot of money was invested, about 20,000 euros per household on new technologies, but many people just wanted to have a stair elevator or wanted to have access to the outside world. They wanted to leave their houses. They wanted to have a proper kitchen, and that money was not supplied. So the solutions were not supplied. So people were not happy in the end. And I think we could have done more to um, improve the quality of life by investing less. And that was a very hard lesson for these managers to learn and to accept because the new technologies made them um, figure on the, on the cover of nice magazines. But if they had invested their money in new kitchens, they would have been on the cover of these um, magazines. So that was some implications for the management. Like it's not about ego, it's about impact. Um, so the question.